Now, as we finish our journey through the book of Ruth, seems like it was a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, when we started from Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, we conclude with happiness for Naomi and Ruth. So we're going to see what this looks like. We see here, after Boaz redeemed Naomi's land and Ruth, he took Ruth and she became his wife. In other words, pretty much what it's saying here is they got married. This happened. We saw in the previous uh, passages that this was what Boaz was setting out to do. From this, what we see here is that Ruth's status has been changed, of course, by the grace of God. She was a foreigner, outsider, servant, but now she is the wife of Boaz. Then they consummated their marriage, and Ruth bore a son. In Ruth's previous marriage, her husband died without a child. But this time, Ruth has a child. And notice what the verse says here about Ruth having a child. And the Lord gave her conception. Naomi had prayed for rest, security, future for Ruth all the way back in chapter 1. And she came up with a plan to get this for Ruth back in chapter 3. Here we see that Naomi's prayers to God have been answered as Ruth now has a husband and has a child. And significantly, we read that the child was a son. Context-wise, in the Old Testament, while daughters had inheritance rights and were just as important valued as sons, the family line was actually carried on through the sons. And for Naomi and her deceased husband, there was a son now that would continue this family line. And again, this was all done by God as he gave Ruth conception. Gift from the Lord. God had not forgotten his servants as he provided for their needs. As we move along, interestingly, after this news of a child, the focus returns to Naomi. The last time she was mentioned was back in chapter 3, verse 18. And her return here is actually very appropriate. Back at the very start of Ruth, chapter 1, the first five verses, Naomi's life was quote-unquote at rock bottom. She lost her husband. She lost her two sons. She had no heir to continue the family line. It looked like her family was on the brink of extinction. She was a widow, but a daughter-in-law who was a widow. And when she returned to Israel, when she heard that somehow, not sure exactly how she heard it, but she heard that God has returned to the land and given food to the people. When she returned to Israel, she was greeted by the people, specifically the woman back in chapter 1. They saw and they listened to Naomi's bitterness, emptiness. But now here they reappear. I'm not sure if exactly the same woman that appeared back in chapter 1, but a group of women now reappear to tell Naomi the birth news and the end of her emptiness. And notice what they say here, the women to Ruth. I'm sorry, to Naomi. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you to stay without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. First and foremost, what we catch here is that the women gave all the credit to God for everything that had They first and foremost praised God for everything. And they praised God for preventing Naomi's life to end in bitter emptiness and turning her life into joyous now fullness. Now, Boaz, you were here with us the past few weeks, though Boaz was the redeemer who had birthed the child with Ruth, what we see here now is this redeemer is no longer Boaz now, but now has transitioned to this child. And what this child would do is this child would then be the one 
who would not only carry out the family line, but also take care of Naomi in her old age. The woman continued by wishing this child's name to be famous in Israel. Previously, after Boaz redeemed Ruth, the elders of the city blessed Boaz's reputation to grow and grow. But here, the women hoped for the child's reputation to go beyond the town, but to the entire nation, Israel. After that, we read that the women now list promises that Naomi would enjoy from having this child as her redeemer. In verse 14, they had hoped. Here in verse 15, they voiced promise. And they say, he shall be to you a restorer of light. What that means is that the child would renew Naomi's art by assuring that her family line, which was headed for extension, would continue. There was a problem back in chapter 1. The problem was a need for an heir to continue the family line. Now there is an heir that will be able to do so. And they continue, and a nourisher of your old age. Now what this means is that the child would also nourish or provide Naomi with food, actual physical food. Again, back in chapter 1, there was another problem, and there was a need for physical food. And though there was Boaz who provided in his kindness and grace to Boaz, uh, Naomi and Ruth, this child will be able to now continue to provide for Naomi. Think of it as Boaz giving much grace and providing the food to Naomi and Ruth, and now with this child, there's an overflowing of that. Then the woman ends by saying, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, what this means is that the women are giving the reason to Naomi's situation right now. They are saying that because of Ruth's deep affection and devotion to her, Naomi is being blessed. Throughout the book, you can recall uh, Ruth's commitment, initiative, courage, dedication, faith to Naomi. And this phrase here seems to suggest that Ruth's love was unusual for a daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law. And her love for her mother-in-law will be shown by having her own son serve as Naomi's redeemer. In a sense, here's what Ruth was doing. She was giving her child to Naomi so that her child can take care of her mother-in-law. Then in closing, the woman said, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. What this means here is that the women are comparing Ruth to seven sons. Now, in context-wise, in the uh, ancient world, the Israelite ancient world, we talked about how sons were the ones that carried on the family line. Now, seven sons were the ideal number of sons for an Israelite family. But in Naomi's case, Ruth is more to her or better than even that ideal number of sons. Again, in ancient times, the people strongly prefer sons to daughters to carry on their family line. So here, in saying that one woman was worth seven men was the ultimate compliment to Ruth's devotion. And after hearing this good news, hope, and promises from the women, Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap. At last, Naomi held literally in her hands what she had hoped for and prayed for, a child. And after taking the child in her hands, she held the child on her lap. Then she became his nurse. In other words, Naomi became the child's foster mother. Naomi didn't become the mother of this child, but the word used for nurse here implies that Naomi was given parental responsibilities for the child's upbringings along with. Think of in today's term, Naomi uh, being like a godparent. And through this, Naomi's journey started with seemingly hopelessness 
bitterness and emptiness. I encourage you, if you have not read through the book of Ruth or you're joining us for the first time, go read the first three chapters. Now ending with joyful hope, happiness, and fullness. In a way, Naomi's situation here points to the Christian today who surrenders unanswered bitter questions to God, goes to God, hangs on to him and his promises, as he or she remembers God's faithfulness and gives glory to God for his amazing grace. God had not forgotten Naomi, not forgotten Ruth. And so the women, we see something a little odd here. The women, after seeing Naomi hold, hold and embrace this child, say, a son has been born to Naomi. Again, they were emphasizing Naomi's future hope. Not necessarily that this was literally now Naomi's like son. But emphasizing Naomi's future hope. And read that they even named the child. Why not Naomi or even his parents, Bo, Boaz and Ruth, named the child, right? Now, interesting, this is the only time in the Old Testament where a name is given by someone other than a parent. There isn't a real clear reason uh, from uh, interpreters and commentators and scholars to why this is the case here. There's different speculations. But in any case, the name given to this child is Obed. The name actually means one who works, one who serves. Seems like a great name for the one who will be doing that for Naomi. And we read that Obed was the father of Jesse, the father of David. We see a short genealogy here. And we see that this child, Obed, if we, if we didn't know, now we know here, turned out to be the grandfather of Israel's most respected king, King David. And with just that small, short genealogy, we see that the book of Ruth is not just a story about two desperate widows, even though that is the case. It's not a happy love story between Boaz and Ruth, which is still the case. Or even a happy ending for Naomi, which we see here is the case. It becomes a crucial moment in Israel's larger national history. Ruth, Boaz, and Obed, their child, have become famous ancestors of a dynasty. And for Ruth, who would have thought that such a dynasty would come forth from a Moabite foreigner outsider? But more importantly, God's providence and sovereignty takes on a whole new meaning here. His gracious care for Naomi and Ruth was divine guidance for Israel and also for the entire world. Or in other words, through a Moabite foreign outsider, through the line appears Jesus Christ. The book of Ruth started with pain, agony, and uncertainty now ends with joy, triumph, and certainty. Naomi went from empty to full. Ruth had now security and rest, but now she was no longer an outsider. She was no longer a foreigner, but she was an insider, and now she was an Israelite. But most of all, the book of Ruth shows God's caring providence and gracious sovereignty over individuals, and to entire nation. And God did it by using the faithfulness of just everyday, ordinary people. What seemed like at times hopelessness was God actually weaving together his grand story of hope. Now the book ends with a longer genealogy. You would think like, oh, what, what's up with genealogy? Why, why does it end like this? If you recall, Ruth started with in the days when the judges ruled, back in verse 1, chapter 1. Meaning there was no king, 
Everyone did what they wanted to do, what was right in their own eyes. Now closes with the genealogy of Israel's most famous king. God used all the events in Ruth to bring about his purposes that were so much bigger than Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz could have possibly imagined or foresaw. Behind the scenes, God was working out his providential plan to bring King David to the throne. And from that line of Israel's most famous and respected king, Jesus Christ appears. And again, King David, for those who know King David, he was a great king. But just like Boaz, he was just another pointer to the king of kings, not just of Israel, but the world. With that, I want to say that the more we get to know the Bible, the more we will get to know the Lord and his story, his plans, and his purposes. What that implies is that if we're not opening up our Bibles and we're not even reading, how can we then know the Lord, his story, his plans, and his purposes? Just take Ruth here as an example. You see a bigger story that God had in mind. Mind. Why, from this line of David, the most famous and respected king of Israel, why from this line of David did Jesus Christ appear? We don't have to go too far. We don't have to search too much. Simply have to open our Bibles and read. Matthew one twenty one tells us, For he will save his people from their sins. Luke 19.10 tells us, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In other words, Jesus came to find and rescue lost sinners. By paying the price that our sins earned, he had set us free and on the path towards heaven. Think of it like this. Hopefully this illustration will help. All of us has a one-way ticket to hell. The price of our sins. What Jesus did on that cross was take that ticket out of your hands and give you a different ticket. And this different ticket could never be earned by us. It's like you trying to get to heaven by climbing a rope of sand. It's impossible. This different ticket was earned by Jesus' righteous light And this ticket allows us then to go into God's presence now and for all eternity. In today's passage, or in the book of Ruth, we saw Ruth's love and devotion to her mother-in-law, Naomi, but doesn't even compare to Jesus' love for us. Jesus left his place in heaven, not the better fields of Moab, Jesus left the intimate fellowship that he had with the Father and the Spirit for the pain of this fallen world. And on that cross, Jesus demonstrated his amazing love, not to the lovely, but to the unlovely, to sinners. In Jesus, God's love came to people like us, those who have repeatedly said, thought and done things that we shouldn't have said, thought and done. Some of our sins are here are large. Some of our sins here are small. But each one of them is enough to condemn us to hell for all eternity. What if the story just ended there? But God. Those two words, but God is probably one of the greatest two words we could ever hear. You can read Ephesians 5. I'm sorry, Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 with me. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins at which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature chosen or bad like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love of which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. This was you, or this is you right now. For those who are here that know this grace of God, give thanks. What a great time this week, right, to give thanks. And for those who are here that do not know this grace, I simply ask you, are you trying to change your ticket on your own? Do you believe that somehow you can be good enough and do good enough things that God's standard will be flexible to accommodate your efforts? I say to you this with kindness as much as possible. Don't be delusional. The door to God's kingdom is only open to those who know they have nothing to offer. The door is not open for the strong and proud. It's only open to the weak and humble. So whoever you are, no matter what you've done, there's room for you to kneel at the foot of the cross. And God doesn't leave us as we are, as he finds us in his grace. He changes us when we open our hearts to him and submit to him. Like God changed Naomi's heart of bitterness to joy, God's transforming grace changes those who desperately cling to Christ and know they can't do anything other than cling on to him. And when found in God's grace, God, what, what he does here is beautiful. He changes our status. Through Boaz, God changed Ruth's status from a foreigner and outsider to Israelite and insider. God also changes our status through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greater Boaz, the, the ultimate redeemer with a capital R of each of our own personal salvation stories. He sought after us while we were completely lost and wandering, whether we realize that or acknowledge that or not. And not only does Christ save us, he gives us a new status found secure, loved, cherished child of God. Let's take some time to respond in prayer to what we have just heard from God's word this morning. And for those joining us for the first time, we're just simply going before the Lord, not ignoring perhaps there's certain things that we have felt or thought of as we heard from God's word this morning. Maybe a prayer of confession, repentance, request, Maybe you're not sure exactly what to say. Maybe you have questions. Whatever it may be, even if it's silence, I would encourage you to go before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Lord, as we have wrapped up and finished the book of Ruth, we saw those wonderful characters. Lord, we saw... Uh, the grace that you've shown to these people. And we also saw, Lord, your overall grace and sovereignty and providential care. Lord, you did not forget your service. And Lord, you have not forgotten us. Lord, we also needed that redeeming. We couldn't do it on our own. We need someone else to do it. Jesus, you are our greater redeemer. You sought after us while we were completely lost and wandering. Lord, you saved us, and now you give us new status. Found, secure, love to cherish, the child of God. Thank you, Lord. I pray that we take time this week, on a specific day as well, to give thanks. But help us, Lord, to give thanks to you of your grace each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.